Okay, I'll, I'll try and use the mic. Um, so I'm going to talk about two things which are close to the heart of California, water and money. <laughs> and of course, they, they, are, they are completely uh, linked. There's, um, we have many outstanding hydrologic engineers who invoke things like Darcy's Law to show that water follows gradients and flows downhill and, and so on. The truth of the matter is, of course, that, that in California, we have economic hydrology, which means that water flows uphill, downhill, through hills, towards money. Um, and um, that, that's one of the things that makes this state very interesting and prosperous. Because this is the, the nature of us. We're a Mediterranean climate. And we essentially reorganized a industrial and now post-industrial economy by putting the economy where we want to live and moving the water there. However, problems arise. And one of the problems is this concept of the Sacramento Salatine Delta, which has been described correctly as the hub of California water. So I want to talk about three uh, studies, with some, one of them still ongoing. And they influence this ongoing problem how do we get water across, through, or under the delta towards exporters, or do we? At the same time, how do we restore the ecology? And how do we, how do we make sure that in doing that, we don't wreak havoc on the economy in the delta? Because the delta is a place with a, with a vibrant economy. So I'm going to talk about three things. One is pricing mechanisms and how we might some experiments we did, economic experiments we did, on ways in which we might price an alternative conveyance facility. Secondly, I'm going to look at the impact on the delta economy if we build that facility and if we do not repair all of the levees that are inevitably going to collapse sometime in the future, some of them. And thirdly, the third thing I want to talk about briefly is this concept of what would the cost be of habitat and can we in fact have some forms of habitat, fish habitat and farming coexist. So three things. Pricing, how do we pay for this canal if we build it? And what's the problem of getting it built if we ask the users to pay? What's the impact on the Delta economy? And can we have an interaction and coexistence of habitat provision and farming. So th these, are, um, these are some of my co-authors from um, all of us from the uh, um, Watershed Science Center in, in Davis, except for Stephen Kroll and Jonathan who are from Colorado State and Sac State. And here's, here's some things. There's, there's a lot of discussion about the Delta, but fundamentally the driving factors are basic physics. It's basic physics. Earthquake, um, unpredictable part of the California scene. The Hayward Fault runs right underneath the delta. Flooding, that's going to be a function of, of any changes in climate that might occur and management as well. Sea level rise, unless you think people are making up those photographs of the Antarctic, um, I uh, think that's something that's hard. So one of the problems with the delta is we have got unstable and increasingly precarious levees, and we have to have a decision to repair or abandon. Now remember, there's exports of water going out of the Delta to some Bay Area water utilities, some Southern California water utilities, and some agricultural water districts. And it runs somewhere around four to five million acre feet, depending on what number you take. A year. There is a 64% probability of a total collapse of this system within the next 50 years if nothing is done. So you've got a major economy and a major input to the economy at significant infrastructure risk if nothing is done. So this is, this is not a question of, of, of whether to do something, it's really where. And so we have these 
had these driving variables, habitat and, and sea level rise. So physics is working. Physics is working because the sea level is coming up. Physics is working because if we believe the projections of temperature change in the precipitation, and forget about precipitation, we're going to have flashier, more prominent floods. And physics is working in as much that the levees, which were built at the turn of the century, many of them, are getting increasingly unreliable because the soil inside the levees is oxidizing and going down. So the soil inside goes down, the water outside goes up, and you don't have to be a brilliant engineer to know the inevitable outcome. And of course, a number of levees have collapsed, most, most recently Frank's track. The policy questions are, if the levees collapse, should we fix them? And the classic one, of course, is Frank's track, where various estimates put in at about a 90 million dollar cost of fixing it when it collapsed about five years ago, four or five years ago. Um, and the seven now. Seven. Thanks, Dan. And the um, the private real estate value is about 14 million. So let me see if we use 90 million of state funds to repair 14 million of private property. No. I don't think that's a great idea um, to do that for the other 32 islands at risk. Um, so which ones are on the do not resuscitate list and which are not? And is that acceptable? How do we get water under or through the canal? Do we subsidize new habitat improvements? And if so, where and how? Policy outcomes. What we've got is the delta interests are particularly concerned about salinity, loss of some of their farming land, and flooding of some of these islands. The economic policy questions are, what are the economic impacts on the delta? Could we get a tunnel built by user contributions as opposed to general obligation funds? And everyone in this room here is well aware of the environment for floating large quantities of general obligation funds. And what was the cost of habitat enhancement? Can we, in fact, enhance habitat and accommodate water exports with the Endangered Species Act? Well, here's the delta. And those of you in the back of the room will have a hard thing looking at it, but these dots are levees. So there's levees all around these so-called islands. They're euphemistic islands because these islands are islands below sea level in some places. The yellow lines here are the federal levees. The red ones are privately funded levees by local flood protection districts and so on. That's really important because who picks up who picks up the tab when they get fragile? Secondly, elevation. Oxidization has done its thing, and these red dots are islands below 15 foot or below sea level. Have any of you who have driven through the delta and had an experience, which is sort of surreal, of driving through farmland and watching a freighter cruising along about 30 foot above you in Sacramento Ship Canal? We suddenly realized, I'm down here, that ship is sailing at sea level. Whoops, there's a difference. And there is, um, I don't have time to show it to you today, but there's an intriguing engineering simulation which goes under the technical name of the Big Gulf. Um, and um, that's where you have an earthquake and simultaneously nine of these islands fail. And the water, salt water comes rushing in here, fills this up with salt. The exports to the San Joaquin Valley and Los Angeles are here, and the whole system is shut down for at least two years, with billions and billions of dollars in costs. Okay, so elevation has something to do with it. Um, here's one alternative I put up, because uh, this is a, an earlier book we wrote. This is a peripheral canal. Um, the favored one currently is, a, is a, a, some sort of tunnel which goes underneath for various reasons we can go into. But what we're talking about is some infrastructure facility that will decouple exports from the delta ecology and the delta water system. Now, one of the reasons for this, of course, is that the fish in the delta are threatened, various species. And I don't have the fish slide here. 
But running through the financing side, that the main beneficiaries are metropolitan, East Bay, Mars, West Side Irrigation Districts, and, and um, some other districts. They have a very different willingness to pay and ability to pay for water. The other interesting characteristic is the ability to divert water into this system is inversely proportional to the amount of water you want to develop. So if you want to take a relatively small amount of water, your probability of getting it goes up. But because the environmental flows in the delta are specified, the number of days in which you can shift water into an export facility goes down as the facility capacity expands. So we have a very interesting economic situation with this facility. The cost per unit capacity falls off, as do all large infrastructure. And so as you build it so it can take more, the cost per unit goes down. But the probability of getting the water also goes down. And so the cost per unit water has to go up. And the question is whether those two lines cross. And, and this is this is the exceedance curve. So as the volume goes up, the probability of getting it falls off. And if you go to somebody and you say, I've got a water supply for you, but it's only good 40% of the time, um, they will look at you in, in askance and say, well, what use is that to me? Now, actually, it, it is of some use for replenishing storage facilities. And, and that's a valid use. But obviously, it's of much less value than the, than the higher reliability walk up here. And the take home thing is that we wanted to know how would revenues look if we price things by reliability class and ask people to bid on them. So to find out how whether this was a, a, a silly idea of to build a public infrastructure or publicly proposed infrastructure, first of all, without a fixed size, but have it you bid and then we'll build it. It's the opposite of if you build it, they will come. It's if you come, we will build it. Um, and we want to look at how people might respond to these signals. So we got a bunch of students at Cal State in Sacramento. And being economists, we decided that people respond to money. So we gave them money. And we didn't tell them who they were playing, but they had four different players. They had a large urban um, person. We had a small urban contractor. We had a large agricultural contractor and a small agricultural contractor. And I calculated what, what the value functions of water were for those people. We told each player they got a $15 show up amount and they could earn up to $90, $100 in an hour and a half if they were good traders. Or they could go home with their $15. And of course, we got the distribution because some students are good calculus and others are not. Um, the interesting thing was that they behaved pretty logically. Here's, here's the question about whether we're going to get a, a piece of infrastructure of a fixed size built. And this is the probability of having it built. And the black ones are when we've priced it on reliability pricing. So the black histograms show the actual fact we had a probability of one being built, and out of, we ran 12 different experiments um, over different groups, a total of about um, 240 students. Um, and the probability of getting something built with reliability pricing was much greater. The computer which was playing the game against them would tell them whether there was enough money to build the canal or the tunnel. Take home point here. But if we price things with reliability pricing as opposed to a, a flat rate pricing, the probability of getting something built by user contributions is significantly higher. Second thing, what about size? Again, the reliability pricing in all cases except one dominated the, the fixed average cost pricing. And we had a larger unit ignore the, the numbers there, a larger capacity unit built. And so the take home message was that if we can essentially extract those rents from the people who are 
prepared and able to pay the high rents and act as what economists would call a discriminating monopoly, that people will voluntarily bid more accurate prices more often, if we like, do this reliability pricing. Now, there's two types of free riding in economics. And, and free riding is when somebody gets something that they don't pay for. And if you have this reliability free riding, when you re rely on, on the other person paying the share of your reliability, and this capacity free riding. The term free riding came out this way. These treatments are, this is a bad table, but basically that's fixed size historic allocations. Fixed size reliability pricing, changing size historical, and changing size reliability. And just without worrying about the standard errors and so on. These are these in, in, in uh, tens of millions are the um, free riding estimates. And the, the point, take home point is simply this that the reliability pricing with self-sizing systems has the lowest free rider cost. Interestingly enough, if we stay with fixed size, uh, fixed uh, pricing, historical contracts, but changing size, of the third party free rider cost is still high. So this combination of self-sizing and paying for reliability is the lowest free rider capacity. Okay, so take home points. Private financing of infrastructure works in experiments and should minimize free rider costs. These large infrastructures are subject to capacity free riding for pure engineering sizing and reliability free riding if we have a uniform price mechanism. But if we combine reliability pricing with self-sizing, um, then we'll get the least free rider. Okay. Impact on the Delta economy. The green areas are the areas where some of my colleagues in the watershed sense have calculated, that helped a little bit, that these islands have insufficient value both in infrastructure terms and in productivity terms to repair the levees if they collapse. And so we've marked these islands as essentially do, do not restore. Now, one of the questions that came up was, well, come on, you're going to trash the economy, right? We've got all these, these, these bait shops and beer places and, and, and launching ramps and valuable farms and motels. So we went to Dun & Bradstreet to collect individual tax data from the Department of Commerce. And we found out that Dun & Bradstreet also give you the geolocation. And we said, OK, where are these businesses in the Delta? And each of these little brown dots is a business. This is the back end of Stockton. This is the back end of, of uh, Charles Crosser and, uh, Fair, and uh, Fairfield Rio Vista. Really interesting thing, where are the businesses not? The businesses are not in the dangerous areas. There's almost nothing there, guys. <coughs> and so um, the point is that the word about where the levy failures are going to happen is already known by all the local people. Here they are. They're voting with their feet. And they're not putting businesses in the areas which are at risk. Second thing is, well, OK, but we've got an agricultural economy here. What about this? And if you take the average over the agricultural economy of the whole delta, it looks very valuable. But if you zero in, and we can now do this with, with detailed land use field by field with satellite data and so on, we did a field by field analysis of these islands, and they're predominantly small grains, corn, and pasture, depending on the relative price. <coughs> and so these crops have two characteristics which are really interesting. One is they are less susceptible to yield loss through salinity. And secondly, they are, of course, much lower value. And commodity crops, they're not the specialty crops 
of asparagus or pears or wine or all these valuable crops which are grown in the secondary area of the delta, which are not at risk. And so, again, like the dots on the Brun and Dun and Bradstreet maps, it's where things are that's really critical for the economic impact. And if, if we look at this, that um, most of these subsided islands are expected to flood between now and 2050. And these green islands do not pass pass the do not repair test. And there's a, there's a, a write-up um, you can download from the Watershed Science Center, um, which explains the, both the engineering and the economics behind that. So what about salt? This study is the first time, the first time, a hydrodynamic engineering salt model has been run for this system. And these, are, these little dots are all the places where the, the salt was, was measured. And I took those, th those relationships, and we have agronomic relationships of which this is an example of how much yield is lost uh, in um, beans in this particular case, but it, it's different for every crop. And so we put the salt loads against the crops and against the loss of crop value. And then we ran the, the engineering model for this situation where we diverted water out and put it in a canal or a tunnel and took it south without running it through the delta. We left the delta flows exactly as they should be, as the law specifies, and we looked at the impact. And here was the really surprising thing. The salt hardly changed. And when it did change, it really made almost no difference to the total revenues. They're less than 1%, less than 1% of, of that delta economy. And we ran this um, for um, sea level rise, dry years, average years. We even ran it for three foot sea level rise and a canal. And we still didn't get it going above more, more than for average years, more than half a percent. Take home, take home message, because of the low salinity impact of, of this canal, and because of the low salinity sensitivity of the crops, and the value of the crops grown in those areas, the overall impact on the economy of salinity due to a canal is really low. And something which I'm sure, given the cost of the canal, adequate compensation would be easily forthcoming. Point is, we can compensate for this. If we look at it on the county basis, we've got three things. We've got salinity, habitat, diversion, and flooding. And of those, the really big costs are in flooding. Those, those, those are the are the, are the costs, and this is measured in jobs lost. So moving on to the options, we need to have a levy policy. Our funds are limited, and the levy funds are limited. We need to prioritize them, and we need to focus the available funding on those levies. We can't fix everything on those levies which give us the greatest social return. I'm talking about jobs, houses, and employment, and, and industry. We should try and encourage growth in recreation, and it may partially, not fully, but partially offset some of the losses from agriculture. And we absolutely have to develop, and can afford, mitigation strategies for the landowners. And we should not restrict it to the strict legal definition, even if they're private levies, we should, we should do mitigation. Habitat. We're doing. So these are the areas that, which used to be, I think they are still identified by the Bay Delta Conservation Program um, for habitat. The biggest one is just over here to the west of us is the Yellow Bypass. And that's this big green thing, and these other ones are, are various sloughs and so on. What they what the BDCP wants to do is to put these into fish friendly habitat. It's a problem. 
The fish are salmon. The little salmonids come out in the spring in this particular run. And they want to be hanging out in nice, warm, shallow, nutritious water in floodplains. I'll show you a picture of our, my fish model in a bit. Um, problem is that this area, for those of you who have driven 80 or 5 recently, will note is an active rice growing and an active agricultural area. And the very latest, they just finished, they finished planting regular rice about two weeks ago. So here's the problem. This is the, this is the fish model. These are fish on the floodplain. These are fish who are unfortunate enough to be, these are salmon, left in the river. The interesting thing is that, that the floodplains are extremely nutritious, safe, and efficient areas for fattening fish. It's a complex thing. Here's, here's, a, here's a rule here if you want to measure how big they are. Fat fish, thin fish. Um, and these guys, the, 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 the nutritious fish, of course, uh, are better able to survive and, and battle predators. There are several factors, I'm told, and the experiments are ongoing on this. One is nutrition. The interesting thing is that the fish appear to like rice stubble and rice residue a lot. They grow very well under it, under their first few trials. Secondly, because the rice fields are carefully graded to flow the water onto one side of the rice and the off, when the water recedes, it flows off gently and the fish flow off gently into the river with it. There are no hollows or swales for them to get caught up in and have the herons come and eat them. And so, it's ironically, farming turns out to be possibly looking like a relatively efficient way of getting young salmonids from thin to fat, um, something that we want to do, because if we can show that we can restore, partially restore the salmon populations, then of course this allows us to manage it for both ecosystems and exports, both of which are valuable for California. <coughs> How might we do this? So what we looked at is, this is the farming, and these are the crops, this is the other bypass, so this is Highway 80, those who drive to through to Davis or Vacaville or Woodland, you go off here. Next time you drive it, have a look, and you'll see that this is, this is habitat and farming in action as you drive. Don't look too much, but uh, <laughs> have a glance if you can. And um, what we did is we took this and we said, how damaging is it to the farmers to plant their crops a bit later than they really would like to? What do they lose? And so, we went and, and how much land would be covered at different flood levels. So we ran an engineering model for the floods, and these are the flood patterns, and these are different flow rates and so on. But you can see that a reasonable size deliberate flood, and this is this of course is the emergency flood plain that floods naturally um, through a thing called the Fremont Weir to save the pressure on the California land, uh, on the Sacramento levees. And what we would be doing is we'd be making it flood longer uh, to give more fish habitat. And so we know which fields are going to get flooded. And then we ask the agronomists, well, what would happen to the yields? And this is, this is a crop which I call tomatoes. Uh, you call it something else. Um, and, um, but it goes into ketchup. Um, and this is the uh, agronomists ran these models, and the, uh, these are the yield functions. And basically what happens is, as you shift back into the planting date, and this is running around May, you start to lose this much yield. And you go down here, and if you put a cost and a revenue on that, pretty soon you get to the stage where it becomes more questionable to planting. So we've got a really interesting trade-off. The longer you have it, the fatter the fish get, but the thinner the farmers get. And we've got to have um, a, a balance between those two. Can we do it? answer is, in economic terms, yes. It's too early to tell in fish terms, because the, the experiments are going on. But what we've done is we've taken these various scenarios, and I would point you towards one which is called 
conservation measure 2, CM2. And this thing can be run at relatively low cost to the YOLO <coughs> economy. And these are the costs to the YOLO economy. You can download all these reports from, from the Watershed Science Center. But what we've done here is, and this report is currently out for review, but it's publicly available if you need it. We've bounded the costs between an annual cost of about 9 million to an annual cost of about 1.5 million. That, in water, in water terms, is, is, is a small change. Um, the costs, frankly, are a lot less than I thought they were going to be. Um, and particularly if we do some clever things like CM2, where you, you just extend the natural flooding. You don't induce an artificial flood. You extend the natural flooding for a longer period. And that turns out to be much cheaper. And we will find out in, in a year or so how much uh, more effective it is from the fish biologists. So again, I, I, I hate to be the bearer of good news. Um, <laughs> but it's true that um, it's not as expensive, and it doesn't look that it's either or, it's fish or farming. I think we can have both. And the interesting thing is it might be, might be that farming is actually a better way of having salmon habitat and drought, uh, I mean, flood protection in the same area. Remember, if, if you're farming a field, there's no cottonwoods growing. And, and that means you've got a clear run when the big flood comes. And Sacramento, of course, is very susceptible to floods. So, the, the habitat thing is that, in fact, agriculture can yield valuable salmon and flood control benefits. We've got what we're looking for in, in, in our natural systems is both an economic and an ecosystem benefit. That, of course, latent flooding translates into, into losses. And if we can go with the CM2 option and not flood during dry years, which is also, of course, expensive use of water, then likely it'll be better. And therefore, what we can do is we can time our flooding, it looks, so that we can get substantial fish benefits without, without putting the farmers under so much stress that they go out of business. So what are, the, what, what are the conclusions? In terms of the islands, we ought to apply triage with compensation. Okay? We ought to know before the islands collapse what the benefit cost of repairing them is. Not like Frank's track when we had to go in there and, 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 um, and, and repair them right away. For conveyance capacity facility, we think that we can, it's possible to get private user financing, user-based financing, and set up a user-based finance system based on the reliability value as well as the quantity value of water, and, and it can be phased in. And finally, in habitat, we're looking at the joint production of both agricultural crop production and salmon habitat and floodplain flood protection. So it's floodplains in the early part of the winter and salmon habitat in the spring. And during the summer and late spring farming. So there we have it guys. There's, there's three of these aspects where we're trying to work in the Watershed Science Center by combining several different disciplines. There's fish biology, engineering, a little bit of economics, and um, some public policy. Generally speaking, again, I'm surprisingly, for an economist, optimistic about what we can do in the way of trade-offs. Thanks very much. Nobody else will. I'll ask a question. Have you shown some of these financial concepts to the state water contractors and the Yolo County stuff to the 
Uh, decision makers in Yolo County? Decision makers? I actually did this for the uh, Yolo County, decision makers. Um, I presented the County Board of Supervisors, and um, when I explained that I, I, I really think that farming can coexist with some of these, these more um, restricted flooding options, they were pleasantly surprised, I guess. Um, they, they thought it was an either-or battle. Um, so that report is currently out for, for public comment at the minute. We've had some comments from, from not too many comments from the fish people. The financial stuff is, is has not been published. It's, it's still early days. And in fact, we're thinking of, we're thinking of running some, some additional experiments when, when the students come back in, in, in the fall. Because one of the things that, that was a little bit squirrely was that we offered people rebates if they bid too high. And, and what we found is that the low value ag producers, when faced with the off prompt possibility of being cut out of the, of the reliability altogether, overbid and, and, and actually bid more than they, the revenues would support. And then we rebated them the money. And so the students were able to take, take their uh, special friend out for dinner and a movie after all. Um, but um, that was too much insurance, I think. And so we want to rerun some experiments without that. But the results, I think, will still be very robust. One of the takeaway lessons here is if you stick to historic contract-driven financing, you may be putting your project at grave risk. If you stick to historic financing uh, and, and, and contracts and try and do it through the usual channels, it probably won't fly. That, that. We have to, um, the probability of getting it built goes down substantially, and that's the take home thing. We have to have a more flexible and realistic, and when you think about it, um, I don't know whether any of you have it, but I, on my air conditioning, um, PGE um, gives me 40 cents a month or something like that, but it has a little controller, and it won't let me turn my air conditioning on on really hot days before 7 o'clock, or sometimes it pulses it.